Hey everybody, and welcome back to Submarine History. I've been enjoying the YouTube channel um, Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast with Seth Peridon, a History and Deputy Director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum, and retired U.S. Navy submarine captain Bill Toady. And, uh, you know, what I like most about that channel is its unscripted, casual approach to history. Um, you know, it's just like two guys who could be sitting in a bar talking, uh, tossing back beers and, you know, debating the Pacific War. So recently, um, I watched episode 301, which is a recap of the Pacific War in 1943. At the beginning of the episode, there was a discussion about actress Hedy Lamarr and a World War II patent she had on a secret communication system for radio-guided torpedoes, uh, but was unsuccessful in getting the U.S. Navy to accept it. Captain Toady said that, uh, you know, the Navy, U.S. Navy never developed radio-guided torpedoes. Why? You know, because radio waves don't work underwater. Completely dismissing Hedy's work as an inventor and, in general, the idea of a radio-guided torpedo. But hey, you know what? You actually can make radio work underwater, and you can control a torpedo with it. We're going to find out how in this briefing. But first, read the description to this briefing. It has relevant, related references and links. Last, but certainly not least, thank you to the United States Naval Institute for all they do preserving and promoting world naval history. The work USNI does is invaluable. Consider supporting USNI with a donation or membership. If you have any questions or comments regarding this briefing, post them below in the comments section. I also have a Discord for more in-depth discussions. Uh, you can find an invitation link on the channel page. We'll start the briefing today with a quick background on Hedy Lamarr, and then we'll talk about her secret communication system, or frequency hopping patent, and how that was related to Italy's interest in developing radio-guided torpedoes. Finally, uh, we'll talk briefly about why the U.S. didn't use Hedy's patent. So let's hit it. Okay, so here's the setup for today's story. As I mentioned, uh, it was episode 301 of Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast, where at the beginning of the episode, Captain Toady talks about a question from a viewer concerning a Netflix documentary on the actress Hedy Lamarr. The documentary included uh, a segment about Hedy's work as an inventor, and in particular, a patent she obtained during the war for a secret communication system using frequency hopping that could be used for controlling torpedoes. The documentary even credited Hedy's invention as having an influence on the creation of Wi-Fi and some other technologies that we use today. So Captain Toady, you know, he acknowledges the fact that Hedy Lamarr did spend time working on inventions, but argued that she didn't invent what was referred to as frequency hopping. Furthermore, what she proposed for torpedo radar guidance was impractical, and that it's not possible to guide a torpedo with radio waves anyways, since the torpedo is underwater, and radio waves have poor performance underwater. He's not wrong on that point, by the way. We've talked on this channel about the issues with using vertical rod antennas on submarines when they're submerged, and you'd have the same problems with an antenna on a torpedo. So I was really curious about all this, and I watched the documentary myself, and I read the patent she obtained for her secret communication system. All right, Hedy Lamarr. Um, you know, while we're not going to do a biopic on her, uh, we do have to talk at least a little bit about her for context. She was born in Austria, uh, excuse me, she was born in Austria on November 9th, 1914, uh, and got into motion pictures early in life. She was making pictures in Europe when, at the age of 18, she married Friedrich Mandel in 1933. Friedrich Manda Mandel, uh, he ran an Austrian military armament business. He was pro-fascist, and he worked to provide arms and munitions to both Italy and Germany before the war. He was also a control freak with Hetty, you know, which isn't surprising. One of the things he liked to do was have her attend his business parties, you know, mostly because she was eye candy. Um, she would attend these business parties and listen to the conversations. Some that piqued her interest were discussions about submarines and discussions on the development and use of radio-guided torpedoes. People at these parties would agree it would be great to be able to guide a torpedo to a target, but the question would come up, how would you prevent radio jamming? because that was understood as a thing at the time. Let's talk about frequency hopping, or spread spectrum radio communication. 
It wasn't long after Marconi patented radio that people figured out you could interfere with a radio transmission between two parties if you knew the frequency being used, you were close enough, and you had enough power. Nikola Tesla uh, received a patent in 1903 for a system of signaling uh, that indirectly references frequency hopping, and Dr. Jonathan Zenick, uh, a German electrical engineer, wrote a textbook in 1908 on wireless technology that directly references frequency hopping to prevent communications eavesdropping, if you could figure out how to do it efficiently. Frequency hopping today is no big deal to implement since it's done digitally. But how might frequency hopping have worked back in the early 1900s? This is Alice and Bob. They're having a conversation over radio on frequency A, whatever that frequency is. Now, as Alice and Bob are having their radio conversation, Mallory, who has been scanning the radio looking for interesting signals, comes upon the conversation Alice and Bob are having. Mallory could remain silent and just eavesdrop on the conversation, or she could actively interfere with the conversation in a number of ways. Bob and Alice have anticipated that something like this could happen, so they have decided to implement a protocol anytime they are on the radio, and that is, uh, they will periodically change the frequency they are using based on a written procedure they both follow. Mallory, not knowing this, is listening when suddenly the frequency goes quiet. This principle of shifting frequencies to obscure communications was used by Germany during World War I. Radio was in its infancy as a military tool in World War I, and you would have only have seen radios employed at very high levels, like the division, corps, army level, because the systems were so bulky. Radios were used on U-boats in World War I, but they were temporary installations. One surfaced, an antenna had to be deployed, so it wasn't really convenient for tactical purposes. Anyways, the radio operators would have had books similar to code books, which would have told them the frequency sequence to use during the transmission and the procedure for making the frequency hops or changes. Now, it's in the late 1930s when Hetty, working in the movies in L.A., meets a music composer, George Antle, uh, who had been working in L.A. composing music for movies. At some point, Hetty talks to George about one of her invention ideas, a way to keep radio communication secret so you could use radio to guide a torpedo to its target. Hetty must have talked specifically about the problem of using one radio frequency to guide because it could be easily jammed. Um, what you needed to do was hop around different frequencies. But how would you do that with torpedoes? There is no person on the torpedo who could work from a frequency sheet tuning a receiver on the tor torpedo to the right frequency. It had to be automated. This is where Anthil comes in. He experimented with player pianos, setting up multiple pianos to play music in sync. What made player pianos work was the use of a paper roll with perforations representing the 88 keys of a piano. As the paper roll turns, a machine reads the perforations and selects the correct key to be pressed. He knew the procedures for keeping the pianos in sync while the paper rolled, and this was the basis for how you change the fr frequency used to guide a torpedo. This concept of using a streaming paper strip with perforations representing letters or numbers uh, to record or transmit a radio message actually goes back to the 1870s when Emile Bodo, uh, a French telegraph engineer, invented the Bodo code for radio telegraphy. So Hetty and George, uh, they have an idea for a system that would automatically change the frequency of a radio signal between an operator and an object. Because George and Hetty approach the problem from the perspective of the entertainment in industry, uh, you know, music and player pianos, they developed the idea for their patent around a mechanical system representative of what you'd find in a player piano. But they had a problem. Neither Hetty nor George are electricians or electrical engineers, and they don't have the knowledge to write a detailed, credible patent application. So what they decide to do is submit their patent idea to the National Inventors Council for evaluation and feedback. Based on the strength of their submission, the National Inventors Council got Hetty and George in touch with Samuel Stuart McCowan, a professor of electrical engineering at Caltech, who is able to fill in the gaps of the patent application, addressing all the electrical, electronic aspects of the patent application itself. 
And here it is. Patent 2,292,387 for a secret communication system. Filed June 10th, 1941 and issued August 11th, 1942. Four days after the U.S. had landed at Guadalcanal. Uh, it has Hedy's given name in the patent, by the way. Uh, it's seven pages long, which includes two pages of technical sketches. So what does the patent specifically cover? Okay, first, uh, the design of two radio systems, a transmitting system controlled by a human operator and a receiving system on a torpedo. Second, uh, a frequency hopping method built into the radios using a shared paper tape that had a sequence of frequencies each radio would follow and a method to ensure both radios stayed in sync. And then third, the method uh, used to physically control the torpedo, uh, frequency and tone. What the patent did not cover was how you'd get the radio signal from the human operator to the torpedo. What the patent describes in general is that you'd have a torpedo launched either from a ship or a plane, and you'd have another observer plane with eyes on the torpedo and the target. Through some method not covered by the patent, that observer plane is able to steer the torpedo to counter the evasive maneuvers of the target ship through the use of a radio signal that was changing periodically. But how do we solve this problem of sending a radio signal from a plane to, our tor to a torpedo running underwater? Well, this is how the Italians solved that problem in World War II. The Italians had been working on this idea of radio-guided torpedoes since at least 1932. Remember, Hetty marries Fred Friedrich Mandel in 1933, and she's attending business parties where she hears conversations about the development of radio-guided torpedoes. Likely, they were Italians since Mandel was dealing arms with them. This is a picture from a demonstration where we can see an Italian SM-79 uh, dropping a torpedo with some small object behind it. Let's take a closer look at what's going on. Uh, the bottom left is our torpedo drop, uh, and we see the circle around the torpedo and the circle around this really small object behind it. Above it, and it's not a great pick, uh, but it kind of looks like there's a torpedo strapped to a wing and there's something attached to the torpedo itself. Now the picture on the right, that's the buoy uh, that we see trailing the torpedo as it falls. And that's how they did it. The buoy's connected to the torpedo through a cable. The buoy stays on the surface, obviously, and it acts as the antenna passing a signal from the now observer plane to the submerged torpedo. And the Italians successfully dis demonstrated the system under simulated combat conditions. This is how the Italians envisioned using radio-guided torpedoes in combat. An aircraft uh, flying at an altitude of up to 1,000 meters would release a torpedo uh, buoy combination aiming for the bow of the target ship about 4 to 5 kilometers out. At a speed of about 65 knots, uh, a torpedo would impact its target in about 2 minutes. During that runtime, the plane reduces speed and runs parallel to the target so an operator on the plane can keep visual sight on the buoy and the target. He's operating a joystick, and when he pushes the stick either left or right, a sub-audible tone is sent along with the carrier wave on a st static frequency that the buoy picks up. Okay, There's no frequency hopping. In response, solenoids would be actuated to push the torpedo rudder either left or right, depending on the tone, to keep it on a course to hit the target. Fluorescent dyes were released by the buoy to help the operator maintain visual contact. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, the Italians exited the war before they could try these torpedoes in combat. Upon the surrender of Italy, German forces confiscated all the materials associated with the project for study. It seems that this was a, you know, a pretty elegant solution to improving torpedo hit percentage. So why would the U.S. Navy turn down a chance to take the technological lead in this area of weapon development? A couple thoughts on that. First, uh, George Anthel, uh, you know, he realized after the fact, the way they wrote the patent, yeah, it sounded like you literally had to put a player piano on the plane and, uh, you know, one in the torpedo. Now, George would argue with the Navy, you know, don't take it literally that a uh, miniature mechanical system could be designed that could do the job of rolling the paper tape and changing the frequencies, something clockwork based or another mechanical rotating piece of equipment. You know, think something along the lines of Enigma. But in spite of this, the Navy was unmoved. Second, at that point in the war, 
The U.S. Navy doesn't have a torpedo that works, okay, and we're talking about the Mark 14. How can you consider something complex like a radio guidance system for torpedoes when the torpedoes you have don't even go boom when they hit something? You have to solve that problem first before you start thinking about those more complex things down the road. Third, uh, Midway showed that aerial launch torpedoes in an environment with robust air defenses, that was quickly becoming a thing of the past. In the context of the Pacific War, you couldn't afford to have a plane hanging around a couple kilometers out trying to watch and guide a torpedo to its target. It would be a very obvious target for carrier, air patrol, and uh, any aircraft. Fourth, um, you know, by the time we get to a solution for the Mark 14 around the fall 1943, you know, basically the war is over at that point. Um, we don't need a complex method for guiding a torpedo to a target because the Japanese can't offer any meaningful seaborne resistance anyways. What we do have to do, uh, we have to invest in things like developing better anti-aircraft solutions, okay? And, and that's, by the way, that's something that they talk about all the time on uh, the unauthorized uh, history of the Pacific War. They, they, they do talk about that evolution of the United States of anti-aircraft defenses, how that changed over time to match like changes in what the Japanese were doing. Um, you know, maybe in the context of the war in the Mediterranean, uh, if you could do it at night, maybe a single plane flying at low altitude on a high-risk, high-reward mission, maybe it would make sense. Then, um, but you would still have to deal with the issue of jamming and no way to stop it. If the Italians started using these things in combat, the Allies would have made it a very high priority to develop a jamming system to counter it, as they did with the Fritz X, with the Fritz X guided bombs. Uh, but you know that'll be a story for another day. So this wraps up our look at Hedy Lamar, her efforts to develop a method of frequency hopping for guided control of torpedoes, and how the Italians tried to implement. A weapon system like that themselves. Some final thoughts. Did Hedy Lamar invent frequency hopping? No, she did not. She partnered, she partnered with George Anthel uh, to patent a system that would allow the automated control of a radio guided torpedo through the use of a radio signal that was constantly changing by a known technique called frequency hopping. What was unique about the patent was the automatic frequency hopping process itself. Um, I'm going to say a lot of the written work out there crediting Hetty as inventing frequency hopping that people didn't actually understand what they were writing about. Uh, at least that's my experience from the light reading I did on the subject. Did Captain Toady know what he was talking about? Well, he certainly knew that the Italians were the only country experimenting with radio guided torpedoes. And that is a very obscure area of World War II history. And yeah, you know what, from his perspective as a submarine skipper, absolutely you couldn't control a torpedo that was running underwater through radio. But from a different perspective, it not only was possible, it was done. So I hope you enjoyed this briefing. And uh, if you have any questions, post them below or head over to the Submarine History Discord and ask your questions there. Till next time, peace out.